Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and it is amazing how virtually every important human rights and civil rights movement has been influenced by and often led by caring Jews. There are Jewish individuals who've made profound contributions to the American scene, American culture, American life. One such extraordinary human being is a woman who for an entire lifetime and for more than a generation has been in the forefront of women's issues and has been an outspoken advocate for women's rights and for the women's movement. What an honor it is for me to be sitting with an icon and a hero of mine. I welcome to L'Chaim Letty Cotton Pogrebin, who is one of the heroes of the feminist movement in the United States of America. In the 1970s, Letty was a founding editor of one of the most groundbreaking magazines in American history, Ms. Magazine. And Letty was also the co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus. Letty Pogrebin is also an author of 11 books, and she has served as president of the Authors Guild. She's a guest lecturer throughout America on a wide range of social issues. And Letty Pogrebin has also worked for women's rights inside the Jewish community and has been an activist in quest for peace between Israel and the Palestinians, having served as president of Shalom Achshav, Peace Now. And Letty Pogrebin's latest book, just published in May 2015 by the Feminist Press, is her second novel entitled Single Jewish Male Seeking soul mate. It's the story of Zach Levy, a left-leaning son of Holocaust survivors who promises his mother that he'll marry a Jewish woman. And he does, but it doesn't work out. And then he falls in love with an African-American woman, but he breaks up with her because she's not Jewish, even though she becomes pregnant with his child, whom initially he'll have nothing to do with. And then when the child is roughly three years old, Zach changes his mind and becomes involved in bringing the child up as a Jew. There are so many contemporary Jewish issues explored in Letty Pogrebin's novel, Single Jewish Male Seeking Soulmate. And Letty, what a thrill it is to have you sitting at this table. It's something I've wanted for so long. Thank you for making the trip out here. My goodness, Mark, thank you. I can't get over it. You know, usually you respond with humility to an introduction <laughs> like that. But I'm like old Golda, my year, who said, don't be humble, you're not that great. <laughs> well, you are that great, but I don't want you to be humble. Okay. And, you know, you've earned, you. you've earned a certain recognition and stature in the Jewish world and really on the American scene. And, and some, I hope people say to you all the time, thank you. You know, we thank you. And, you know, it's obvious I'm not a woman, so what? I'm a, you know, I'm a Jewish liberal kid who grew up in the, you know, the 60s and the 70s, and I saw the change taking place. It was a change that also influenced me. It influenced, by the way, letting my brother even more, who's four years younger. And I was at Columbia. I graduated Columbia in 67. Mm -hmm. The bust was in 68. There is a generation divide in some way between 67 and 68. My brother is a little older, a little younger than I am. He goes to Yale a couple years later. And the women's movement affected him even more than it affected me. For me, it was, I, I was in awe. For him, it became part of his world right. and his wife's world. And That's what we wanted, yes. normalization. And you did it. Yeah. You know, and by the way, it's easy to say now, but you look back yeah. in the late 60s, early 70s. Letty, we lived in a different world. Totally different Totally world. different world. Mm -hmm. And e even start there for me. Yeah. As you look back on the sweep of the, the efforts you've made on behalf of women's rights, not only in America, but really worldwide. 
do you often, do you ever say to yourself, oh my goodness, at the time I would never have imagined right. how far we've come? And Actually, I remember saying in 1973, well, we ought to get this done by 1975. <laughs> because once we expressed all these injustices and we pointed the way and we said, you know, a woman shouldn't need her husband's signature to get a mortgage. A woman shouldn't have to establish credit as the wife of. Women should have the right to go to Harvard, Yale, and so on. They should have the right to be um, construction workers, you know, and they should have the right to be Supreme Court justices. We thought, well, everyone's going to see the It was so, it was so obvious, yeah, right? Yeah, it was it's, obvious. It's a question of just pointing it out, <laughs> and we'll get it by 1975. And then there was a moment when Ronald Reagan was elected when I realized I'm going to be in this for the long haul because there is, in fact, a backlash. Mm -hmm. And people in power don't want to let it go. And so this was going to be a struggle, and it has been a struggle. Everything we've won and earned in the secular women's movement has had a pushback from conservatives and right-wing fundamentalists who really want to maintain the status quo. They want women to stay in the home and not to challenge uh, male power and male kind of access. In the Jewish world, once something is uh, achieved, it stays achieved. Mm -hmm. You can't unordain a woman. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh no, we had you in the minion, counted you last Shabbat, but not this Shabbat. And there's not that kind of pushback. Mm -hmm. You know, things have settled into a new kind of stasis and normalization. So it's for me a great uh, point of, of, of comfort to be in the Jewish world, oddly enough though not in the Jewish communal world, but mm -hmm. in the Jewish spiritual and religious world. Yes, because we've, we've got women on, on the bima, you know? We have a, bat mitzvahs on Saturday. I was bat mitzvah on Friday night. I wasn't allowed to read the Torah. I, I had a, a kiddush with sponge cake, period. <laughs> that was my celebration. Where was that? At the Jamaica Jewish Center in 1952. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful rabbi named Gershon Levy, who was, for some people in the conservative Jewish world, was a great... Uh, he was a great light. Great Absolutely. Light he was. Uh, and that means you grew up in a typical, traditional, I say traditional, mainstream conservative home? Yes. I call it high conservative. High conservative. <laughs> and what My about... My father was president of the shul for six years. My mother was, you know, president of Hadassah in Queens. They were hyper-Zionists. You know, I always say Israel was my sibling rival because my parents were always out at meetings. Um, you know, I, I was raised in that old Ashkenazi, you know, we used to be immigrants and now we're making it sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are a lot of people in your audience who have of had course. that experience. Of course. But do you remember it warmly or does it bring back troubling memories well, for you? Well, thank you for asking that because it's, very complicated, and what happened is I was fully Jewishly educated because my father didn't have sons. I was his last chance, the third daughter. And so I was educated, quote, like a boy, and had a bat mitzvah and went to the yeshiva. What about your sisters? No, not at all. Isn't it? Why no, do you because think that they, well, they come from other marriages. This is oh, I see. Why? Okay. And they're much older than I, okay. 14 years and 12 years I old. I see. But in my case, my father did invest. He was a Balkore. He he could read the Torah, you know, the Cantillation. He was a top very scholar, educated Jew. Very educated, and, and by very the way, okay. I want to keep interrupting you. No. What about his tone? Was he gentle? His, was he strict? His, was his he... tone was, you know, if you want to engage my attention, ask me about the Talmud, ask me about my law cases. Otherwise, pretty much I'm bored with you. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. you know, he was an old-fashioned old kind of guy, but he was uh, educated as a lawyer. He was, in 1923, a graduate of NYU Law School. Very unusual for, right. for a Jew. He was right off the boat. He was pregnant. His mother was pregnant with him on the boat. And he always reminded my mother that he, who was a greenhorn, <laughs> that he was born here. He uh -huh. got born here, you know, three months after they landed. But the issue for me that's when you ask, is there anything painful associated with that upbringing? Very much so, because with all that education, when I was 15 and my yes. mother died in 1955, I was unable to count in the minion. My father did the thing that you do. You count the, everybody in the living room to make a minion. The room was full of Jews, but only nine men. So my father picked up the phone and called 
our shul and asked for a tenth man. Because he would not include you as I, a tenth. I said, you can't do that. I, I'm bat mitzvah. I'm a daughter of the commandments, you know. And, I, you know, I have all this education. Doesn't it mean something? And he said, asur, it's forbidden. Now, this was a man who drove to shul before there was a tshuva, a, a rabbinic response that you could drive to shul in conservative Judaism, not anywhere else but to shul. He drove, he made his own tshuva. And he also smoked, put out the cigarette three blocks away from shul. So I, I said, you know, you, you, you made rulings for yourself. What about for me? Asur, forbidden. And I left Judaism uh, for 15 years. Okay, th you were very angry. Very angry, very hurt. I mean, in comes a tenth man who never knew my mother. He held the siddur with a the, the little memorial prayer book upside down. Right. He couldn't uh, even follow the prayers. And he, he passed the physical, and I didn't. Yes. I said, if they're not going to count me in, I'm counting myself out. Mm -hmm. Did you make a point of this with your father? Pretty much, but, you know, he was very rock-ribbed in certain, <laughs> certain ways. He was open to all kinds of challenges if they were interesting and the disputation could lead him somewhere. But, you know, this, it would be asking him in 1955 to have the sensibility of 1970. Okay. I know it made you angry at Judaism. Mm -hmm. And you have, incidentally, been very open and honest in some of your writings about many, many aspects of your personal life. How angry were you at your father, and what did it do in terms of your relationship to him? Well, I think I count my father as the progenitor of my intellectual bent. Uh, I learned to engage on substantive issues because that was what interested him. But what I learned from my mother, even in 15 years, was how to be a mensch. My mother was uneducated, but she made the house beautiful for all the chagim, all the holidays, and Shabbat. And so the, um, I, I really owe my father a kind of understanding of Ju Judaism, Jewish life, Jewish texts. I owe that to him, but I owe the, I owe the gemuch, the, you know, the, the yes. tom, the texture of life to Lovely. my mother. What was your mother's name? Siro Sarah. Okay. But that and he was Yaakov. He was Yaakov. But that doesn't answer my question. What did you do with, I assume you were also angry at him. And the question is, you left Judaism yeah. institutionally for a period of time. Right. Then I want, to hear, I want to hear about what you know. You were the second program to sit in that yes, chair. I, I had the extraordinary pleasure of sitting with your daughter, Abby. I am so um, happy to be in this chair. <laughs> I feel her aura. I do, too. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I and know she talked to me about, mm -hmm. a little bit about, mm -hmm. the fact that you, her mother, had been on a journey, and at a certain point you come back. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what you, you know. Did in the meantime. Yes, and, and to what extent you, you're a product of so many influences. Mm -hmm. we, all, we all are. Right. Okay. And I'm just trying to understand the extent to which, as a 15-year-old right. who experiences an incredible hurt. Yes. On top what, of an incredible loss, loss. that so, your faith, which you have served, I was a very pious little girl. <laughs> I read. I went to shul every every Friday. You loved night. it. I loved it, and so for it to fail me at this it, Letty, sort it's of huge. seismic it's moment, huge. it was huge. And okay. so many women have come up to me after my talks. I speak all over the country and very often review this because I know that it resonates for so many women. They couldn't stand at the graveside. They couldn't, they didn't have a, a bat mitzvah. Or they found out their brother had this big party after a bris and they were just welcomed into the world with a high, you know? So it resonates and women often say to me, I had that experience. I was closed out. I didn't exactly. count in the minute. Yeah, you're speaking for many people. Yeah, I got And that's why I, I'll push you only one more time. Yeah. What does it do to you and your father? What happens for the next 10 years between yeah. you and your father? And for the rest of his life. Okay, uh, yeah, for the rest of his life. I loved him for who he was, yes. but I was never going to get mothered by him. Does, but did it, did it create a distance? What, no, I okay, didn't did not. create a distance, okay. except that I became the chazanit. I became the cantor of a congregation that we started in Fire Island. Uh, for High Holy Day services, and I invited him, and he never came because he was never going to leave his shul and his tradition and the conventional Judaism of his entire life. But I thought he should have come 
they should have witnessed that all that he poured into me came out. I mean, I'm davening kol nidre. Why wouldn't he want to hear it, you know? So that, that pain lasted, but I accepted him for who he was. I understand. He was born in 1900. Yes. So, I mean, think of that. Yes. A, it was we talk about, a We lot. talk about the 70s as a different world. Yeah. Different planet. Right. Um, you have how many children? Three children, Three grandchildren, ch and six grandchildren. Mazal tov. Thank you so much. <laughs> what, he lived long enough to see these grandchildren? He's, no, he saw the children, but not the grandchildren. Okay, but he did see the children. Yes. He's, so, he knew your children. Yes. And... You know, was he was he able as a grandfather to sort of be more open than he may have been with, as a father, Jewishly? I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't think so. I mean, he was a, he was a lot more liberal than an uncle of mine who, you know, was very 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 rigid and and almost cruel in his um, insistence on doing things the right way. But, you know, you weren't going to change this generation okay. of men, no. Okay. When he sees your work in the feminist movement mm -hmm. in the 70s, how does he react to that? Proudly. Proudly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, proudly. I mean, he was a, a very intelligent and, and uh, a contemplative man. I mean, he thought things through. And I think he started to see the justice of it. He was proud of that. It wasn't like he was going to leave his shoe and come to hear me uh, chant Kol Nidre, but he would tell his friends, you know, my daughter is one of the founders of Ms. Magazine, and, you know, she was just on the Today Show, and that kind of thing. So he did take pride yeah, in that. Yeah, took pride in that. And it also means he understood what the movement was about. I think he And did. respected that. Yeah. Even if he wasn't ready yet to open it up within a conservative synagogue. Right. For America, he understood how important it was. I think so, yes. Oh, okay. I think he saw, he saw the change in Reform Judaism. Although he remained a conservative Jew his whole life, he did witness that there was ordination of women starting in 72, and women were counted in, in uh, the minion and did get aliyot. And he recognized that, and it was okay with him. It was Reformed Judaism, you know. <laughs> but then it became he conservative Judaism. He didn't live Judaism. to see. He died in 82, and the first woman was uh, in 85, in conservative. Yes. There was a woman who accepted yeah. for ordination. Right. But she didn't become ordained till eighty five. Right. Right. Um, did you ever toy with becoming a reform Jew? Because the reform movement has been in the forefront of women's yes. issues in the Jewish community. When I came back to Judaism, yes, um, I joined Stephen Wise Synagogue, which reform is a reform synagogue. synagogue. Yes. And when I saw Sally Sally Price and and uh, Cantor Ellen Math on the Bema at the same time, I wept. I couldn't believe I had lived to see the day. Though I don't respond viscerally to reform services, most reform services, they're a little too stripped down for me. I'm a member of B'nai Jeshurun, which is, like Cynthia Ozick called it the hoot nanny on the Upper West Side. It is a unique experience. Very unique. But it's fabulous. I love it. It's I fabulous. Love it. But and I you know, did, your daughter's involved with Central Synagogue. My daughter's the president of Central which Synagogue. Which is also fabulous. Yeah. And I don't know if you know that we broadcast, we televise every Friday night that. live services. I do know. From, that. And we are thrilled. And the feedback I get from I that lady is unbelievable, even from Orthodox yeah. Jews who whisper it to me. Oh, because Angela is such a, a, yes. an angelic presence. And, and the music that is that voice. Right. Oh. Oh, it's, uh, uh, so my daughter's going to be on the Bima from now on, which is really wonderful because my father was a president for a long time of a synagogue. And now my daughter is a president. Okay. In one moment, I want to ask you how you come back to Judaism. Yes. But I want to stay in the 1970s for a moment. Okay. You were, it, you know, you were not alone. You were surrounded right. by, you were, what, you were a colleague of, a major colleague of, some of the most dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, creative women that American history has provided yes. in the 20th century. Yes. And would you recall for me just for a moment, what was that year? You, you, Gloria Steinem's next to you. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it like creating Ms. Magazine? And what was that era like? And when you say to me so honestly, I would show them the truth, and in two or three years, America <laughs> would embrace it. But there was a certain kind of 
in a positive way, naivete yes, to the quest that. that made it very exciting. And made dinner. it, yeah, and made it sort of the, the, big, the big happening thing because we were so fervent and we had this broad spectrum. You had the, you know, the tough marching, you know, demanding, and you had Gloria was such a gentle voice of reason. Betty Friedan was, you know, charging in her own way. <laughs> and I, I felt I was sort of in between them, to the two. But for the magazine, we always wanted to touch every issue on, in every issue. So in one issue of Ms., we would want to have something for homemakers and something for lesbians and something for working women, something for welfare women, you know, and something on women's health and something on, you know, a popular culture figure. So it was so replete with meaning and substance, every issue. And when I look back on it now, it's, I marvel that we were able to do this. We started with just five of us, and we were able somehow or other to reflect the movement and also lead it. Yes, mm -hmm. so yes. We were, we were kind of the, the mirror and the window. Um, That's lovely. Yeah. Well, kola to you. Thank just, you. It's just amazing. Thank you. And everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, many people would love to be able to have a, a feeling that they've made a difference. You've made such thank a difference you. and you, you continue to do so. Thank you. Okay, now tell me. What brings you back after the experience you have at yeah. 15? Yeah. And for many, many years, you are a secular Jew, correct? Yes, I was a secular Jew, except uh, of the Hamish stuff. I, yeah. was a, I was a home based practicing Jew. I yes, mean, it's a, talk to me about that for one moment. You know, there was an issue as to whether the feminist movement was in some way critically condescending of a woman who, after the issue was made public, would choose to be what was it called, a homemaker. Yeah. You spent a lot of your time at home. Well, I felt as if that was a complete straw man or straw woman. I mean, Explain. Because what we were about, and still are, is opening up uh, the full spectrum of human life, which means you want to choose to be a mother and homemaker if that satisfies you, if that brings you a sense of fulfillment and, and self-expression. Who's going to say don't go out and work? But if you have this driving need to become a concert pianist, nobody should be saying, what are you doing outside the home? You know, if we don't ask men, you know, how can you leave your children, we have to be able to say, you know, women also need to find, bring to fruition all their God-given talents mm -hmm. and everything they have to offer society. That's what we were about. So the idea that we were critical of homemakers was simply a construct of the right wing in order to make turn people think, mind against it. You don't think there it. were those in the movement who were, in fact, critical of the homemaker? You know, there may have been a few radicals, but the mainstream okay. thrust of the movement. If I had been at Ms. Magazine at that time, I would not have heard any criticism of the You homemaker. wouldn't have seen articles about homemaker mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. You would have seen articles about how uh, women need child care because, you know, they can't handle it all themselves. You would have seen letters to the editor from homemakers talking about their marriages. You know, we really, I mean, for everything from the truth about incest, I mean, no women's magazine was allowing women who had been uh, abused as sexually abused to express their experience. No women's magazine at that point was saying, you know, sometimes there's sexual harassment on the job. It had no name. It just was women's lives. This is what it was like. I was an executive in book publishing. You had to laugh it off when men were looking down your dress or up your skirt or making comments because otherwise you'd lose your job. So sexual harassment as an economic issue, that, that was a family issue because if a woman had to put out in order to keep her job and then if she lost her job and then her family was to suffer, we had to make those connections. And mm -hmm. we did. Mm -hmm. We made those connections so that you could see that Family issues were women's issues. Economic issues are women's issues, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Human rights issues. In this new novel, I have a, a lot of feminist sort of themes woven into Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But a lot of uh, the, uh, the kind of intersection of race, class, and gender was articulated by the women's movement. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that the fact that we need to join forces on civil rights because half of all the blacks or Hispanics are women, you know? It's so like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Did you find, by the way, you heard me say in the open, Jews tend to be in the forefront of certain kinds of yes. social movements. And I always felt that the women's movement was, in fact, yes. led in May. In May Disproportionately. Yes. Mm -hmm. You found that true. It, it was it, true, and there's a good reason for it, I think. You know, the Jewish ritual that is the most practiced is the Seder. So once a year, at least, and for many families twice, you hear a liberationist story. And you hear uh, that, in fact, people who are at the bottom can imagine freedom. That, for me, was the paradigm for the women's movement. You know, and all of us are our own Moseses and Miriams. And I think it was a, a kind of template that we have to do for humankind what God did for the Jews. We have to free them, the oppressed. You take that paradigm, you put it on the women's movement, you put it on the civil rights movement, you put it on the anti-war movement, it works. It works. So it's intrinsically Jewish, I think, to become movement-oriented, to get involved, to say, you know, tikkun olam is not just a slogan, it's a way of life. And if you're going to repair the world, you have to repair the pain that half the human race has felt in various situations, as well as look at the other. We used to be an integrated uh, justice movement, blacks and Jews, for example, which again, when you said Zach falls in love with Cleo, yes. she's an African-American yes. talk show host, she's a feminist, and they meet at a black Jewish dialogue group. We used to do that as Jews. Now, most of us are worried about anti-Semitism in Israel. We're not forming common cause, making common cause with other groups. We've become impacted, in my opinion. I like to see Jew, Jew, Jews and, and Jewish congregations expressing solidarity with blacks at this particular moment after the killings in the church in South Carolina, I think that sort of unity has to become, again, a driving force for activism among Jews. Yes. And of course, the Jews have been in the forefront of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement. Yes. And it makes... It Remember make Heschel ju was arm in arm with King. Absolutely. I get chills. Yeah. Don't you get Me chills? Too. Me too. And um, Joachim Prince. Yes. And, uh, and Arthur Lelyveld. Yeah. No, yeah. And by the way, it just, you know, it, it gives me chills because it makes me very, very proud. Me too. Very, very proud. And we had Goodman Schwerner along with Cheney. Yes. You know, they, I mean, that. The boys who were killed in Mississippi. The boys who were Mississippi. killed in Mississippi. Yeah, that should be proof positive. But now it's, it's 40, 50 years later. And where are we shoulder to shoulder? Not in enough places, not on enough issues, in my opinion. And that's, again, Single Jewish male seeking soulmate is about that. Yes. As well as about good for, a romance. Good for you. Good for you. When I, I have, my wife and I have three girls. Mm -hmm. and no wonder you're a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I think if you are a parent of a daughter, yes. you better be a feminist. But it may come more naturally. Maybe, maybe it does. But I wanted to say to you that my, you know, I want my daughter's, like every parent, I want them to be happy. You know the old line, you're only as happy as your least, least happy, happy child. child. Right? Okay. Um, but what I, will want, what I wanted and continue to want mm -hmm. for my daughters right. is that they should have every right opportunity that my sons have. The fact that they are gender female should in no way limit any choice they want to make. And then, Letty, I want them to choose. I don't want them, they shouldn't choose for me, mm -hmm. they shouldn't choose for their mother, they shouldn't choose except for where they want to be. And if they choose to have what is now called a more traditional home or a more traditional life, then that's their choice. There is one question I want to hear you speak about in terms of this because I did speak to your daughter about it. It's hard to have everything in life. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be everything in life. Abigail talked very beautifully about the choices she thought you made and how you were able to both be a very active, present mother at PTA meetings as well as Ms. Magazine. And she thought you were a bit unusual, that you, you were able to combine having a rich, full career and being 
a mother at home. And we talked about how hard that is. Mm -hmm. It's a different, it's still, men are treated differently. If there was a, you know, if a, if a 25 year old came to you and said, Letty, where, how do I balance it? Mm -hmm. What's your advice between, how do you balance a career and being a mommy, wife, home, creating a home <laughs> where Shabbat is in the home on Friday nights and Saturday. How, do you, how does the woman today negotiate what is without question a very challenging ordeal? How does she negotiate it? With difficulty. And it had better be with support, both societal and marital. It has to be, there has to be a, a recognition that you know, there has to be a willingness to pitch in. You can't have a husband, you know, helicopter in and expect dinner on the table. You just can't. And if that's the demand, I mean, in my opinion, she has a right to walk <laughs> or to go on strike. And I know women who said, that. that's it, there's not going to be dinner on the table unless you come home and we work together. You scrape the carrots, you know, and I'll marinate the meat, whatever. But also I recognize that I was very economically blessed. I had, I had a lawyer for a husband. Um, not only was he a very involved father, totally involved father, by which people say, what do you mean an involved father? I mean, he knew their shoe sizes. He knew the names of all their friends. If there isn't that kind of intimate knowledge of a child's life, then the father is not an equal partner. That's been always my test. You know their shoe size? You know which one hates bananas and which one hates peanut butter? or else you're not an involved father. So you need that. And if there is no father, if it's a single woman handling children, she needs social support of all kinds. Imagine you just articulated how much a working mother has to handle and has to balance. So if we don't have childcare, and if the Jewish community charges a fortune for day school, and she's on a single income, this is not going to work. And if the community doesn't accept her, in like synagogue membership as if she is a full family unit, it's not going to work. She's going to feel diminished. She's not going to feel that she counts. It's the old business about Jew, Jew, Jewish life is about counting. We count the Omer and we count the days, you know, and we count the hours of Shabbat. You want to count. You have to count in this world as a Jew. And I think it's very important for the community to embrace single mothers, lesbians. I think we need to say, we are a big tent. We yes, have to be a yes. big oh hell. Yes. Okay. By the way, as you and I are meeting, the Supreme Court of the United States yes. just made gay marriage the law of the land, yes. meaning that anybody had a right, every adult has a right to marry anybody they want mm -hmm. of a, the opposite sex or the same sex. In a sense, that is and also an outgrowth of the work you did. Yes, absolutely. No, it's all linked. All the movements for, for freedom, freedom to simply lead your own life in a way that does not affect other people. It's, it, I'm married for 51 and a half years. That's the fact, thank you. The fact that, that two men can marry does not change my husband and my relationship. Yes. It doesn't threaten it in any way. It doesn't threaten my children's choices. So I've been absolutely pro-gay uh, uh, marriage, pro-gay rights for years. Um, you know, it's such a simple thing, and it works within the Jewish ethos, although despite Leviticus, and I understand, I understand the problems that uh, fervently Orthodox people have when it comes to Torah Judaism, but when it comes to the rest of us who make our judgments based on a kind of, on chesed, on, on righteousness, on justice, you know, there has to be a, 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 a different kind of a filter, a filter that I can only call it empathy. I can only call it feeling, walking in the, in the shoes of the other. Absolutely. I was so happy when I looked at the Gay Pride Parade, when I knew that I saw those rainbow banners. I just, I rejoiced with them. Mm -hmm. Well, I did too. And now it also is important that the rabbinic community embrace it as well, and I think yes. it's moving in that direction. Um, and it, just my own take on orthodoxy, it is possible for seriously committed orthodox Jews 
to also understand that even if somebody is violating a certain verse in the Torah, and there are many verses we all violate, mm -hmm. um, it isn't society's obligation or even right to limit how people live. And what the Jewish world has done marvelously, even the Orthodox world, when it comes to our attitude towards the way people observe or do not observe Shabbat, mm -hmm. which in the Torah is a much more serious violation yes. than homosexuality. And in some way, how we handle Shabbat should be the way we handle, even if you're Orthodox. So there are some Orthodox Jews for whom this is a serious issue. Yes. But there are many Orthodox Jews who say, even because of how I may live my own life, yeah. I understand that I have to give yeah. the gay couple a right to be who they and are. To, and to love who they love, yes. and to stand in the way. You know, the Orthodox community is very variegated. Um, Steve Greenberg is a friend of mine who speaks, who's an openly gay Orthodox rabbi, speaks so eloquently about this. And there are ways to read the verse in Leviticus. <laughs> I have to say something on behalf of the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Please. Alliance, because again, within feminism, we've recognized this full spectrum. The women of the wall, uh, they pray across denominations. Absolutely. You know, they respect the needs of the Orthodox members, but they also have a kind of embrace of the full expression of the reform and reconstructionist and non-denominational. It's possible, and we have almost modeled it, we in the women's movement. Yes. I'm very proud of the role of Orthodox women in terms of scholarship, they, because they make their claim based on halakha, they have become learned, and they're able to, um, you know, get into this colloquy, chapter and verse. Good for them, and yeah. good for you. I only want to, one more issue on yes. feminism. I don't understand to this day why there's still any issue at all about a woman being paid the same as a man for the same work. And that is not something we have yet won. Right. Neither do I. Why? Well, <laughs> again, it's um, a question of, you know, how much power are the people who are presently profiting from differences in pay scale, how, are they willing to give up? How much, uh, how much transparency? If we could get transparency where we knew what the guy at the next desk was earning, maybe this woman at this desk could file a lawsuit. But a lot kind of is a barrier to that kind of openness that would allow us to surface the issue and combat it. Uh, corporations have to take responsibility mm -hmm. and you know, very often people say, well, they're not exactly the same job. Yeah, but sometimes they are the same job, or they're a comparable job. Exactly. A job with comparable responsibility. And then other times people say, well, she doesn't have to support a family. That's well, irrelevant. But maybe she does. And it's ir even if she doesn't, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Yeah. She does the same work. Yeah. She deserves the same pay. I'm with you. Okay. So. Thank you for <laughs> expressing it in such... Um, Absolute bald terms. How do you feel if there are Orthodox women who would say to you, I understand who you are, Lenny. I have no problem with what you want, but understand I am who I am, and I am comfortable in a religious tradition which, yes, does not count me in the minion, yeah. even when my mother dies. What, how do you feel about an Orthodox woman who is comfortable within the Orthodox model? Totally respectful of that. Right. Totally respectful. I do not want to impose my uh, vision of uh, you know a particular set of. Okay, it's important people hear you say this. Yeah, of course, of course, and I, I I'm not only comfortable, I'm respectful yes. of it. I'm respectful because they're very knowledgeable, and because they've thought it through, and because it's not like they're closing their their mind to it. They've said, I see what it is, and I want it. Okay. I want it. I like it. It's gratifying. It, it pleases me. Uh, I, I don't want to be anybody else. Great. <laughs> Great. Okay, good for you. Good for you. And I'm glad you said it. Mm. Now I want to know what happens to change your own vision that you want to come back to formal Jewish life. And again, it's so interesting for me to hear that you chant Kol Nidre, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> I, I have it. to have you do that, yeah. you know, 
But you know what I did though? Tell me. This was in 1970. This was before there was a women's movement, before any of these ordinations took place, including in reform. Only um, um, Mordecai Kaplan's daughter Judith had been bat mitzvah. So do you know why Rikas Beth Judaism was the first to have? Because, of, because he had daughters. Because he had Thank daughters. heaven he had right. daughters. And because Judith was bar mitzvah. And he was courageous enough mm -hmm. to do yeah, it. Yeah, right. exactly. And now every, we all do it. By the way, even in the Orthodox yeah. movement, there's a bat Torah. Yeah, I know. The, it's, there you are know, all sorts the, of... Kaplan influenced us all. I know. It just took different amounts of time to get there. Wonderful. But, yes. Yeah. So, so in 1970, when I... We were in, in this community in Fire Island, and the men are sitting around on the beach saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do High Holy Day services here? We would get all of our yarmulkes from the Schwartz bar mitzvah and the you know, Shapiro wedding, and we'll get donated Manischewitz wine, and we'll all bring like the falling apart Machzorim from our synagogues, and we'll have a service on the deck, a back deck, which was sounding great. And then one of the men said to the other, does anyone know how to do this? Could you run it? And none of them could run it, and I said, I can do it. And, you know, it was kind of like necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> so I sat with the moxer, and I just sort of took the, you know, greatest hits yes, out yes. of the moxer. Right. And we made a mimeograph form of a service that lasted, you know, in my synagogue, in my childhood, it was like uh, Rosh Hashanah was all day till like 2 o'clock, and Yom Kippur was all day, you know, till uh, the third star or something. <laughs> We made it like an hour and a half. Perfect. Perfect. And when I was going to, I did Rosh Hashanah, and then when I was going to do Yom Kippur, I said, you know, this is really too big for me. And I went for a walk on the beach, and I, I'm a believer, so I said, you know, give me a sign that this is okay. And poof comes the most magnificent sunset you can imagine over the Great South Bay. And I said, okay, it's okay, and I did it. I felt really, I, I had an out-of-body experience doing it, just hearing those words come out of my mouth. When you did of, call the Dre? Yeah, the first time. You know, it, it, I, I think it registered with people like, we are doing something really unique, 1970. You were doing something important? Too. Yeah, and it was a breakthrough for our little community, which eventually How many grew. years did you do it? 13. I, I did Marvelous. it till about my full year. <laughs> I did it 13, and then I passed it along to another yeshiva girl. Do you still hear Kol Nidre in your ear? Always. When you did Kol Nidre, by the way, did you wear a talit? No, I don't wear a talit. I wore a long white dress. Okay. I you don't wear a, wear a talit. Yeah, I, I don't wear a talit and, and a yarmulke. I love the fact that women do. It just for, wasn't who you were. For me, it would be a um, male impersonator thing. My father is so associated. I, I told you he's a very I serious understand. Jew. I associate everything with maleness, so I can't. But I love, I love seeing women in their talitot and, and uh, kippot. I just think it's wonderful, and they're comfortable, and our children take it for granted. Yes. It's like, oh, yeah. And they take women rabbis and cantors for granted. And sometimes they say, can men be rabbis? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing. How and far? Judaism is flourishing because of it. You know, I hear all this worry about the, the feminization of the synagogue. You know, and that's if you happen to see two women on the bema, it's suddenly it's a crowd and it's threatening to the survival of the Jewish people. <laughs> I revel in it. I think, you know, we have opened up this wonderful world of knowledge and practice to the other half of the, of the human race. And when women, more importantly, when women are single parents, they can pass along what it used to be only men could pass along. They can pass this knowledge along if they've been educated. Yes. And I want to make sure the audience is heard. Letty in no way is denigrating the Orthodox model. But what she is saying is that where you have an egalitarian Jewish model, there is so much to enjoy and to be enriched by. Mm -hmm. And so if there are Jews who are comfortable there, good for them, and there should be as many opportunities for Jews to experience Judaism in an egalitarian setting as possible. And if people don't want to, then there's al also always an alternative. Nobody's standing in the way. Yes. And, you know, I grew up, there was no woman in the pulpit. Sally Priestan is ordained the year I'm ordained. Oh. We're the same year, 72. Uh -huh. 72. Yeah. And um, where were you ordained? New York. She was in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. HUC. HUC. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting was, I grew up 
there were only men on the pulpit. Mm -hmm. The rabbi was always a male, and the chazan was always a male. And it took me a long time to become comfortable with a female voice. And now in my chavura, in when we do high holiday services, there are women who are, and when I say women, they're 15, 18, 22, 35. There are women chanting Torah and chanting the Haftarah. Beautiful. And it is exquisite. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes say to myself, this was the sound the Haftarah mm -hmm. was meant to be. No, no. This is the sound that you mm -hmm. want to hear the Torah read in. Mm -hmm. And it I get chills again. Yeah. It is so Me wonderful. Too. I'm getting them right now. <laughs> okay. And you helped make all this possible. Thank you. you. Mark. It's Thank amazing. You. Thank you. I, but I, I still want the answer. What happens in okay. your life that so you what say, happened I that I came back? back. Uh, I came back because I became a practicing Jew in that little synagogue, in that little Chavura, what you would call a Chavura, but it, it grew to be a couple of hundred people who came from all over Fire Island. I, did I ever have a yes. building? No, we were given, You're a chavra, we were, it doesn't matter we how large. A, a you were a large chavra, we, good and, for and you. And we, we, we hid all the Christology. We covered it with Jewish symbolism. And somebody made a beautiful stained glass panel that, said, that had the quote from Isaiah, thy house is a house for all peoples. It was so beautiful, beautiful to be in that space um, and to have the ocean, sound of the ocean outside. And you just felt you were in God's in God's place, it didn't matter what the decoration was, and we changed it anyway. But for me, once I was back in doing what I had been prohibited from doing, being a Jew, I had been prohibited from doing what I knew how to do. And here I was, able to offer the community what I knew how to do, and others weren't either willing or able. And I felt, you know, why did I walk out? This is my this is my faith. This is my people, my religion. I'm going to dive in and make it, you know, what I'm feeling right now. So How old are you when this happens? I, uh, roughly. In 1972, I was like 34. 30 32, 33. 32 or 3. So, but I didn't I didn't really fully come back until um, 1985 when uh, women in conservative Judaism were, were ordained because that, that's my movement and that's what I grew up in. And, um, and then I joined B.J. B'nai Jeshurun and Marshall Meyer was the rabbi then. A fabulous Fabulous. Human being. Who fabulous was, you know, he, he worked with the disappeared in Argentina. Yes. He was Jacobo Timmerman's rabbi. Yes. He was a social justice activist and we worked together a lot. On, oh, were you lucky? Yeah, I was very lucky and I felt as if it was all integrated. The words we were saying, the prayer books, the, the singing, was all integrated with the action. It there was, was an like, integrity to it, wasn't not there? Not a seven nishma. We mm -hmm. will do first. Yes. And then we do, and then we listen, and yes. then we heed. So he, was, he made it all authentic for me. Uh, yes. And that's when I came back Marshall full Marshall Meyer force. died very, very young. It was he tragic. He did, 1992. He was an extraordinary, extraordinary human mm -hmm. being, an extraordinary rabbi. Yes. Uh, and, and our rabbis today are, we have... Three, those three, terrific. three fabulous yes, rabbis. Yes, and again, and you have a great, great cantor yes. who does the music. There is, uh, yeah, and I, in many ways, I feel that B'nai Jeshurun made made it more permissible for other large synagogues in New York to really go after some sophisticated music. Yes, in terms of a lot of Debbie Friedman music. It, right, yeah. and, Ari Priven is is our cantor, and I mean. I close my eyes. Usually I love the communal singing, but uh, certain prayers, when he sings them, I don't want anybody to open their mouth. His mouths. voice is amazing. His voice is so uplifting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if anybody hasn't yet been to B'nai Jeshurun, even mm -hmm. if you're not a member, everybody's welcome. You should yes. go on a Friday night. A lot of young people, a lot of people have met and married yes. from B'nai Jeshurun because it's a very emotional service. It's, it's really wonderful. The first time I was there, I wept. And to this day, <laughs> if I'm sitting there and I see someone crying, I know it's their first time. I go over and I, this is your first time here. <laughs> they cry. Does your husband go with you? My husband picks me up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> My husband is a, is a very sort of secular, he's a Yiddishkeit Jew. Okay. Yeah, I understand. I'm very sympathetic. <laughs> um, I want to ask you now about a theme in the book. Uh -huh. Okay. So Letty has written single Jewish male seeking soul mate. 
and it follows Zach's really circuitous journey, right? Yes. And it begins with a theme of his, he, he is adamant he's going to marry a Jew. And he's going to marry a Jew because that was what he was taught. Yeah, and he his promised mother, his mother the night promises. before his bar, bar, bar mitzvah and on her deathbed. Okay. So personally, mm -hmm. how do you feel about the issue of, of, intermarriage. Yeah, of intermarriage, mm -hmm. which is so crucial at the moment? That it, it, I don't think there's a family you know, that it, doesn't have And the this latest thing. study says that 80% of non-Orthodox Jews are marrying out. Yes. So it's an issue. What do you but think? But does it mean that you have no... Jewish children? I don't think so. I think it means that you have a challenge in which uh, the relationship, if the Jewish member is educated and committed and says, look, I need, I need to know before we get together that our children are going to be Jewish, then it, intermarriage isn't a problem. It's, you know, these two people who love each other are going to get together, and the non-Jewish member respects our tradition. That's how I see it. And mm -hmm. to exclude the family because he married a, a non-Jew is lunacy. lunacy. It, it, it's losing people. You know, it's like if you want to have no Jews tomorrow, exclude all the intermarried families. It's crazy. But in, in my novel, what I really try to do, and this is through character and plot and happenings and so on, is to challenge what do we mean by Jewish continuity? Continuing what? You know, like one rabbi says, and I have rabbis in this book, because I, I love rabbis. Now I have you to love as well. But, but um, you know, what, is, what do we mean by continuing what? What is this Jewish continuity thing? You know, if you don't know uh, Hebrew, and if you don't know all the wisdom in the Talmud, and you don't know the blessings, and you don't really practice Jewish values, because you cheat a little on this and a little on that, you know, what are you continuing that you're so hell-bent on having your kid marry a Jew? We have to ask ourselves that. What is it we're going to pass along? And if we aren't able to articulate and practice and show through everyday life what a Jewish life is and what a Jewish home is, if you're not coming out of a Jewish life and a Jewish home, then this whole notion of we've got to marry a Jew is, is kind of meaningless. It's really what happens after the two people get together, mm -hmm. and how they adjudicate that mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I could not marry someone who wants me to have a Christmas tree. I just can't do it. I couldn't do it. But I, if someone, if I had fallen in love with someone who said, you know, my faith doesn't mean that much to me. I see how much yours means to you. I'll accommodate. Maybe they wouldn't convert, but the children are Jewish. That to me is, I want my grandchildren to be Jewish. And I want everybody's grandchildren to be Jewish so that we'll have a people, but a vibrant people, a people that isn't just like checking off Jew on the questionnaire, a person who carries our tradition and our heritage in a, in a, a live way. Amen, via amen. You know, <laughs> I told you before we began. I fell in love with your daughter. Now I know why you're do I love your daughter because she's your daughter. Oh, thank you. I love you. You are fabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And what you. you've it's not only what you've done for America, not oh, only what you've done for you. the women's movement, you are a deeply committed, loving, wonderful Jew. I hope everybody thank you. if we all could be what you're hoping to be and yeah, what you're what I'm hoping it would be wonderful. So Koltu Vatslacha, strength to strength. Yeah. It was wonderful having you here. I Thank hope it's only the first Mark. of many times. Thank, Thank you. you. And the book is Single Jewish Male Seeking Soulmate, published by the Feminist Press, written by Letty Cotton Pogrebin, and it is it is a book that should be in your personal home library. Thank you so much. Thank for you so much. I loved, Mark. It. I loved it. I loved it. I love talking to you. Letty Cotton Pogrebin who for a lifetime has been helping to raise American consciousness and Jewish consciousness, issues of women's rights and human rights, and what it means to be a Jew. And her new book is Single Jewish Male Seeking Soul Mate. I hope you've enjoyed meeting her on L'Chaim. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to anything Letty said on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. Hi,
is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.